December 6th, I had lots of non-Japanese friends, and December 7th, I suddenly became the face of the enemy. The Empire of Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii in a surprise attack early in the morning of December 7th, 1941. The United States declared war on Japan the next day, and by February 19th, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, authorizing evacuation of persons deemed a national threat on the West Coast, forcing Japanese immigrants and their children from their homes. But it wasn't until later on that I was cognizant of the, of the injustice of, of this whole episode. And I remember that there were posters placed all through the Puget Sound area. And um, it said something effect, notice to uh, all persons of Japanese descent, both alien and non-alien, are to be removed from this area at, at a certain date. But I, I realized uh, in my adult years, in reading that poster, that we know who the aliens are that they're talking about. They're the first generation. Well, who are the non-aliens? Well, the non-aliens are American citizens by birth here in the United States. In Seattle, Washington, a small community of Japanese immigrants and their families had taken root around Japanese Baptist Church and Fujin Home for Women. There, missionaries from the American Baptist Home Mission Society and the Woman's American Baptist Home Mission Society were ministering to the immigrant parents and their children. Together, missionaries and families struggled to come to terms with how Executive Order 9066 would impact their lives. All of a sudden, curfews. You're not to be out. Our little grocery store was to soon be closed. I guess the most unforgettable for me was when I came home from school and there was this strange man that opened the door and asked me who I was and what I was doing there. And it was the FBI person. They were searching the house. I mean, I was scared. Who was this guy in our house? More than 120,000 women, men, and children of Japanese ancestry were sent to 10 incarceration camps, such as Minidoka in Idaho and Manzanar in California, established by the Relocation War Authority in isolated areas. Before transfer to long-term internment locations, they were housed in assembly centers such as Camp Harmony at Seattle's Puyallup Fairgrounds and Santa Anita Racetrack, Arcadia, California. Well, first, we were sent to San Anita Racetrack, and that's where everybody stayed in the stalls. And my mother would tell me uh, how bad it was in the stalls. I mean, the urine, how difficult it was for everyone to try and clean the smell out. When it was time for, for our people to be moved from Camp Harmony to Minidoka, Idaho, I remember we were standing on the bridge over the railroad tracks in Piola. And we watched our people boarding the trains. It was like the trains were lined up like snakes and they were devouring our, our people as they were loading, being loaded on the trains. The train was shuttered. All the blinds were shuttered with black shutters because they, the government was afraid that we might signal to the enemy on the train. <laughs> to me as an adult later on, it, it demonstrated the wartime hysteria that was going on. We got to this place where there were all these barracks. Well, I didn't know what they were really barracks, but they looked like the rhubarb houses that my father had built. And we had some spring rhubarbs in there. And I said, oh, God, look at all these rhubarb houses. But that's what we were going to live in. <laughs> Well, when we first arrived there, I remember that it was pretty wide open spaces, lots of sagebrush and tumbleweeds, and it was dusty, very dusty and hot. I was in, introduced to the sandstorms. It was, the, uh, the wind was so severe, and we would uh, stop in the middle of the, of the block and put our hands up and hide our face and you'd 
just feel the wind pelting the, uh, the sand at you. Yeah. And I used to wake up with dust all over my face and all over the bed. The food was gritty. I remember walking half a block just to go to the bathrooms. The lavatories were something, you know, I, I guess I was so young it, it didn't bother me that much, but it was kind of open, and so you just sit on, on the uh, toilets and it would just be open, so some people would bring carton boxes or something to just partition it off a little bit. We had to line up for everything, line up for toilet paper because it was rationed and line up for all of our meals. I found this creek and I was down there playing in the water and I happened to look up and there was the, the guard tower and there was a soldier with a gun walking around and, and that frightened me so I ran back to the barracks. Why are we going by and barbed wire? Why are these friends of ours, uh, our church and our community uh, isolated this way? I remember uh, one time when we were uh, playing near the barbed wire, a group of cowboys came by with their cattle. And they looked over at us and said, why are you people in behind the barbed wire? And I was dumbfounded. Why am I here? In the face of incarcerations, physical deprivation, and the hatred experienced by those of Japanese ancestry, the missionaries' work became even more critical during the days that followed Executive Order 9066. Miss McCullough found out that I was stuck in Seattle. And one day, shortly before this evacu evacuation started, she called me. And she said she heard, and she said, I know your dad needs you, and she's going to try and get me home so I could evacuate with the family. And she was so kind. She just really stuck up for me. And that was the beginning of her kind act towards me that helped me through that hard time. After evacuation, American Baptist missionaries followed the Japanese Americans to their incarceration at Minidoka, Idaho to minister behind the barbed wire. These people came and lived as we'd lived and sacrificed who they were to be with the people. They did not say, I cannot help you because you're Catholic or you're Buddhist. They helped the total community that they came to serve. Since those interned were allowed to take only what they could carry, the Reverend Emery Andrews, a missionary pastor of Japanese Baptist Church, traveled from Idaho to Seattle to retrieve personal property that had been stored in the church gymnasium. He made 56 round trips between uh, Twin Falls and Seattle and averaged about 1,500 miles each trip. Uh, Dad had rented a house for us in, uh, in Twin Falls. And we had a, um, an average of uh, 165 people coming and going from our house each month. We had a lot of um, times when, especially on the weekend, when we would uh, have a large group of uh, women, especially Issei women, the older first generation women, come to our house and we'd have a picnic. And I, I know for the, for the Issei women that, uh, and others that came to our house, this was uh, a good respite for them and uh, maybe a, a little slice of heaven, you know, to, to be able to away from the barbed wire. And they came dressed up. I mean, they wore hats. They wore their overcoats with the fur collar on and so forth. When World War II ended, many Japanese Americans returned to what they had left, expecting life to resume in houses they had rented before or businesses they had built based on promises made by friends and neighbors to look after their homes and belongings. Often, though, those promises had not been kept and families went from incarceration to being homeless. Well, the government gave us $25 and said, you know, you can restart your life again. And so we had to make a decision where to go, you know. So I guess our family decided to come back to Seattle, and we were very fortunate in the fact that Japanese Baptist Church had Fujin Home, the, you know, the Women's Home Society missionary, and uh, uh, we were able to use that as a hostel. 
and they never abandoned us even if they went against the norm of the society that they came from. Dad said that he was in southern Idaho somewhere uh, and he had two Issei men in, his, in the back seat of the car and uh, he pulled into a gas station and nobody came out to pump gas for him. And finally someone did come out and, and the attendant stuck his head in the window and looked in the back seat and he said, are those Japs? And my dad said, well, those are Japanese fathers whose sons are fighting in Europe for, for your freedom. I found my spiritual faith as a child in my incarceration in Minidoka because these mission people came, gave up what little they had in the same area that we came from to suffer with us. What I do want the people to know, they might have paid a heavier price than I did being incarcerated. They were like the community they lived in yet despised for helping me. I was quite dependent on the missionaries' help and uh, really appreciated their being there for me all the time. And my simple thank you is on behalf of the 120,000 Nikkei voices of gratitude to American Baptist Home Missions for the people they sent to my community. That is the greatest thank you I can give because it's not from me, it's from the people. And I want home missions to understand this gratitude is beyond Baptist. It's from the community of Japanese Nikkei Americans that are saying do you understand our gratitude?